flew meetings for, for that perfect. About and this perfect uh, when I was really comfortable. Everybody on so board. So somehow the assumption. Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership, a series focusing on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in public health. I am Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and introduce today's guest. Stephen Brashear has been in politics since 1973, serving as the 61st governor of Kentucky from 2007 to 2015. Prior to that, he served Kentucky as attorney general, lieutenant governor, and was a member of the Kentucky House of Representatives. As governor, Mr. Brashear expanded the Medicaid program under the Affordable Care Act. He launched the Kentucky Health Benefit Exchange, benefiting over 500,000 Kentuckians. These actions reduced the state's uninsured rate from over 20% to 8%. For the first time in history, every Kentuckian would have access to affordable health insurance. In President Obama's 2014 State of the Union address, the governor, the former governor, got a shout out by the president on Kentucky's accomplishments on the ACA. The president also quoted from one of Governor Bashir's speeches and ended with the line, Steve's right. <laughs> now why am I telling you this? Turns out the governor's staff had some fun with the phrase, so much so that he, they got t-shirts made up with that phrase. <laughs> For months later, they went around speaking in slight mocking but enduring tones to rush to do whatever the governor asked, even minor little tasks, because after all, Steve's right. <laughs> Most recently, Governor Bashir was tapped by the Democratic Party to give the response to President Trump's recent address to Congress. He currently is a senior member of the law firm of Stitz and Harbison and is also a senior leadership fellow here at the school. Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. John McDonough, Professor of the Practice of Public Health and Director of the Center for Executive and Continuing Professional Education, please join me in welcoming Governor Steve Wright, be sure, <laughs> to the Voices in Leadership series. So, Governor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I should note that you are a soon-to-be published author. You have a book coming out called People Over Politics. So. Good luck on that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I understand in the next few days you might be able to pre-order it on Amazon.com. Okay. So right. I thought I might mention that. I hope I can. I hope I can be first. So you you were a governor for eight years. You've known dozens and dozens of other governors over your time. H how does one get to be a governor? And how did you get to be governor? How does this happen? You wake up one morning and, <laughs> geez, I'm governor. How does this occur? Well, actually, it's a to me, a fairly interesting story. Um, John, I probably wouldn't be governor if it wasn't for a Republican. And you know, I'm a lifelong Democrat, but uh, you go back to the last century when I was a young person, and uh, I was pretty much a rising political star in Kentucky. I had uh, won a House seat in the State House uh, at age 29. Uh, and I'd served six years, then I ran for Attorney General, which is a statewide office, and I won that. Uh, then I ran for lieutenant governor, and I won that. So at 43 now, I'm ready to run for governor. And you know, I'd sort of been pointing toward this uh, all my adult life, and so I ran and I lost. I didn't just lose, I, I lost. I was third in a five-way race, and uh, uh, quite honestly, I was just devastated. You know, you, you point toward something all your life, and then you lose, and you not only lose, but you lose in front of four million people. And uh, that's, that's quite a blow to your ego. Uh, and it was at that time that I came across uh, a quotation from Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt had given a speech in Paris, France, I think in 1910, and it's now a famous quote, but it's called The Man in the Arena. And it paraphrased basically says, you know, it's not the critic who counts, it's the person that's actually in the arena and whose face is covered by blood, sweat, and dust and who is striving valiantly. And uh, if in the end he succeeds, at most 
uh, he gets the triumph of high achievement. But uh, if he fails, he at least fails while daring greatly. And in either event, he will never be among those who are sitting on the sidelines and uh, know neither success nor failure. So that was, that was kind of a consolation prize, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, when you lose like, like I did and, and your life's kind of over politically. So, you know, I got up on my feet, dusted myself off, and basically got back in the law practice and became a successful lawyer and a community banker. Things went very well for 20 years. Uh, and uh, then in 2006, there were a small group of us that were just trying to find a credible Democratic candidate to run against the Republican incumbent. And come that November, uh, before the election in the next year, every one of them basically said no. And so a friend of mine looked at me and said, well, you're gonna have to run. And I literally laughed at him and said, look, I've been there, I've done that, uh, and jokingly said, you know, come on down to the office tomorrow with $10 million and we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about running for governor. Uh, but he said, no, I'm serious. And during the course of the next few weeks, as we were talking about this, he handed me a card. Guess what? Teddy Roosevelt. The man in the arena was on that card. And you talk about sending a chill up my spine. <laughs> and he had no idea of how that, how that quotation had, had been a part of my life 20 years before. But to make a long story short, I got back in the arena and uh, uh, won the primary, a seven-way primary that May, and then beat the Republican incumbent in November. So, um, you know, finally, I had known that triumph of high achievement that Roosevelt talked about. But I tell you, I appreciate it more, quite honestly, because I'd gone through the other before. And that uh, is a kind of an illustration, John, of, to me, one of the main traits you gotta have to be a leader. And that's the daring to fail. That's why we entitled this session that, uh, because uh, if you're not willing to take a risk, if you're not willing to lose, because anytime you take a risk, there's a chance you're gonna lose. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to do that, then you're, uh, in my mind, you're never going to accomplish a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So eight years as governor and other positions of leadership, dealing with all kinds of leaders, presidents, vice presidents, others, what are the essential lessons in leadership that you've learned in your years in the arena? Well, obviously, that's the first one, uh, willing to take a chance, willing to take a risk. Uh, but then also very important is surrounding yourself by people who are smarter than you are. Now, in my situation, that's not hard to do, but, but that's what I did as governor. And, and on my staff, I had people kind of of all persuasions, you know, not just people who would agree with me on everything, but then I listened to them. And that's one of the hardest things for a politician to do is to keep their mouth shut and listen. I mean, we most times just want to talk and we know all the answers, golly, just, just listen to me. And instead, <clears throat> the more we can listen, the more you learn and the better decisions you can make. And I encourage my folks to disagree with me. You know, I would tell them, look, if all you're gonna do is sit out here and tell me how great I am, I don't need you because I know how great I am you know, I, I need you to, to disagree with me when you really do tell me, you know, where I'm off. Because in the end, I've got to make the decision and I'm comfortable with that. But I can make the best decision if I hear all sides of this and am able to consider all the angles of a decision to make. You know, obviously you've got to be patient. You've got to be persistent. You gotta be willing to compromise. That is not a bad word. That's part of what government and politics is all about. But you know, all of those traits to me are one part of the leadership equation. The second part of that is being able to take a decision, a good decision, you hope, and turn it into a reality. And that's where a lot of folks fall down. They don't really know how to get from A to B. Uh, they, they make the right decision, but they don't know how to get it implemented. And you've got to be able to convince people that this is what we ought to do. Uh, you've got to understand the power that you have, and then you gotta be willing to use it. Mm -hmm. You gotta be willing to get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't sit up on the 
pedestal and, and say, you know, I've made the right decision now, all of you all go out and do good, you know, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. You've got to lead the charge and you've got to pull people in, pull them together. And I, we did that over eight years with both Republicans and Democrats, I'm proud to say. You know, I, I, I got to where I was saying around the country when people ask about Kentucky, you know, it's the last place where democracy still works <laughs> because I had a Republican Senate my entire eight years, a Democratic House, I was a Democratic governor, but more often than not, at the end of the day, after elections were over, I was able to get them to remember that they were Kentuckians first and Democrats and Republicans second. Mm -hmm. And the more I could do that, the more we got done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, understanding who you are and how you exercise power and, and a willingness to do what it takes within the parameters of your, of your own right and wrong uh, and ethical standards of doing what it takes to make things happen is, is a key part of being a leader. So let's talk about one specific leadership challenge. So President Obama was never the most popular political figure in your state of Kentucky. His signature legislative accomplishment, the Affordable Care Act, called Obamacare, and then implementation in Kentucky became the issue. How did you address it? How did you deal with it? How did you navigate all of the challenges to being the most successful state in the country in terms of implementing the Affordable Care Act? You have to understand a little bit about Kentucky to understand why I made the decision I did and how we implemented it. You know, Mark Twain was once quoted as saying, when the world comes to an end, I want to be in Kentucky. <laughs> Because, because everything in Kentucky happens 20 years later. <laughs> well, you know, there's some truth to that because uh, while, while Kentucky's made progress in lots of ways, we, we have been held back for decades by fundamental weaknesses. And among the biggest weaknesses is poor health. We, you, ever since they started keeping statistics, we've been at the bottom, you know, and, and uh, as a governor, and uh, other governors will tell you this, you can't really do a whole lot about that. You can do some things, but healthcare is such a big, complex, expensive issue uh, that governors don't have the resources to make huge movements. Uh, you know, I expanded the CHIP program. Uh, I did some things like that, but you know, quite honestly, if you'd, if you'd told me going in as governor that I was going to come out being known as the health care governor, I would have said you've lost your mind. You know, no way that we can really affect much change there. But then along came the Affordable Care Act. And all at once, here was a tool that you could, you could take and if you, if you were wise enough to implement it in the right way, you could change the course of our history in Kentucky in terms of health. And so, you know, it passed, then it got in the courts, and we were very quiet in Kentucky because, as you pointed out, uh, President Obama has about a 30% approval rating in our state. And so we very quietly started planning. We took every federal dollar we could get a hold of to do the planning. And, and you know, I had two decisions to make. I, you know, are you going to have your own exchange or are you going to go with the federal exchange? And that was a pretty easy decision because all of our stakeholders felt like we should have our own exchange, uh, that we could design one that would fit Kentucky's situation better than just a cookie cutter approach, so to speak, with the federal exchange. The other decision was a lot tougher, uh, and that was to expand Medicaid. It wasn't tough from a moral standpoint. I mean, it to me was the right thing to do, but there was a very legitimate question, can you afford it? What, it's, what will it do to your budget? And so, uh, and I knew that's what I was gonna hear. So I asked uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to come in and do a study. I said, I want you to look and make projections about what this is gonna do to my budget, what it's gonna do to the state, you know, is it gonna bankrupt us? Tell me what you see. In six months, they came back in, sat down, looked at me across the desk and says, Governor, you can't afford not to do this because over the next eight years, you're gonna have about $15 billion funneled into your economy. You're gonna create about 17,000 new jobs and you're gonna have a, a, a positive budget impact on your budget. 
Well, obviously I had what I wanted then. Uh, I, I had objective outside evidence from a highly credible international firm that said this was a smart thing to do economically. So we announced it and, uh, and then we planned on our exchange uh, and most people probably know this story, but quite honestly on the midnight before o October 1, 2013, after all the planning, after all the testing, we basically crossed our fingers, said a prayer, and flipped the switch. <laughs> and it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, the Federal Exchange didn't work well at first. Ours worked. And all at once, we became a national model. And I'll tell you, it was funny. I mean, we're on the NBC Nightly News and CBS, ABC, all of them, you know, and they're all talking about Kentucky. And I had Republicans coming up to me who didn't like what I was doing, but saying, boy, I'm really proud. Did you see us on, <laughs> did you see us on national television, you know? And, and uh, uh, so it was, it was really an amazing thing, but the, the most amazing thing, uh, honestly, John, was what happened. I mean, people came out of the woodwork. There was such a pent up demand for health care in Kentucky that, uh, you know, people just said, I'll give this a shot, I'll, I'll at least look at it. I went around the state selling it in these terms. I said, look, you don't have to like President Obama and you don't have to like me because it's not about him or me, it's about you and your family and your kids. So just do me a favor, it won't cost you a dime, just go on that website and take a look and see what you might get. And I'll, I'll promise you, you're gonna like what you see. And so they took me at my word and they looked and boy did they like what they saw because, I mean in 18 months, John, we went from over 20% uninsured down to 7% uninsured. Biggest drop, I think, uh, in the country. Yes, number one. And, and, um, and it's continued. Now, after that first year, of course I still had critics. The, you know, the critics at first said this will never work. Well, of course, we proved them wrong on that. So then they'd move to, we can't afford it. So uh, after the first year, I asked Deloitte Consulting, another international firm, to come in and I said, look, we've got one year's worth of actual data now. I want you to take this data and make new projections. And they took some time, they came in and said, well, I hate to tell you, but PricewaterhouseCoopers was wrong in that last study. They weren't optimistic enough because they said that you were going to create 17,000 jobs in eight years. You've already created 12,000 in the first year. They said you were going to get about 15 billion over eight years infused to the, into your economy. You already have about 1.3 billion and it's going to be more like 30 billion over eight years. And it's going to have, <clears throat> as they said, a positive impact uh, on your budget. So uh, the proof was there and it's been there ever since. I mean, people now are, are covered and they're taking advantage of all the preventive care that's available to them. They're getting the screenings for cancer and high blood pressure and cholesterol and diabetes. And uh, it's just been amazing to see our people. They still don't like President Obama, but they sure like the health care that <laughs> President Obama gave to them. And, and uh, about 10 days after we launched our, our uh, website and our, and our uh, state-based exchange, the president called me because you know they were having trouble with theirs and he called me and he said, Steve, I just want to tell you first of all, thank you. Thank you for showing the world that this can work. And I said, obviously, Mr. President, you know, you gave me the opportunity to do this. I'd never be able to do this if you hadn't passed this law and you know yours is going to work. It's just going to take some time. So we talked for a minute or two and then he ended up by saying, you know, do you have any texts you could send me up here <laughs> to, uh, to help us? Uh, but." Uh, you know, it's, it's, it was an amazing ride and I am proud of what we did because of the effect it has on our people. So let's jump forward to today. Um, one of our colleagues at the school, Michael Reich in Global Health, likes to say, the acid test of any health reform in any country is when it makes a transition from a new president or prime minister <laughs> to a new one and then you decide what's real and what's not. And so we've just gone through this amazing episode with the American Health Care Act, sometimes called Trump Care or Ryan Care, which kind of collapsed last Friday. Right. But you saw it yourself when you left the governorship and you were replaced by a governor who was wholly committed to dismantling what you did. So 
Talk about that evolution and, and your observations in terms of just the extraordinary events of the past month on the nation deciding what's going to stand and what's going to go. What, what, what struck you and what do you think about it all today? Well, there are several things that struck me. Number one, people power. That struck me because, you know, in recent times, people won't get involved. They, they just kind of won't go out. They're, they're sitting in front of their TV set or they're on the internet and they, they won't get involved anymore. And, and what you saw between the election last November and last Friday when that bill failed, uh, you saw people coming out in droves all across the country to these town meetings because all at once it, they figured out that somebody might take my health care away from me. And you know it's one thing if somebody's never had something, but once they have it and they like it, and even ones that don't like it very much, it's better than what I had before, so let's just fix it instead of you taking it away from me. You know, once people are in that position, you saw a whole change. And you know these federal congressmen, congresswomen, senators, most of the time they, they skate under the radar. You know, uh, folks back home, uh, they care about their mayor, their city council, maybe their legislator, their governor, but they don't pay a lot of attention to these federal office holders. And I think they like, the federal office holders like that because they, they can be in Washington, they can do whatever they want to do. They go home and about the only thing that people hear from them are these uh, uh, newsletters with their talking points that are paid for by the taxpayers. Uh, and and uh, you know, they, they're able to get away with a lot that, that their constituents, if they really knew, might not appreciate. Well, you know, this time, I think they felt the pressure. People went to those town meetings and they felt the pressure. And you could see it in their faces when, when this debate started. Uh, secondly, uh, you finally, when, when the CBO put out its report and, and there was an independent objective agency saying 24 million people are going to lose their health care. The premiums for folks between 50 and 64 are going to go through the roof. Uh, you know, I think those people finally realized, hey, hey, we got to back up here. You know, there was some poor planning. I think there was some poor leadership exercised. They tried to move too fast. They really didn't think this bill through. They didn't get their constituencies lined up. They didn't deal with the Democrats. And you know, this is about people. I know that they want to say it's about politics, but it's about people. It's just about human beings. You know, these folks out there that have this coverage, they're Republicans and Democrats too. They're Americans. And, and if, if we don't start thinking like that, then we don't have much of a future. It's time that these folks in Washington think more like what some of us do out in the states. And that is, you know, after elections are over with, you know, it's time to kind of put politics aside. I know it's always there, but by golly, put your people first and politics second, which is the title to my book, uh, needless to say. <laughs> people over politics. <laughs> so in February, um, the newly inaugurated President Trump gave a major address to a joint session of Congress where he blew the trumpet to repeal Obamacare. And you were chosen to deliver the response to the President's address. You, um, how did you get chosen to do this? How did that happen? And then what's it like to deliver the response to a presidential address? I mean, how does it feel and what's going on and what was going on in that restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard lots of comments, so I'll talk about them. First of all, um, if any of you out there were surprised when you saw this older, white-headed guy with this West Kentucky twang giving the response to President Trump, you weren't any more surprised than I was when I got that call. Uh, Senator Schumer and uh, Speaker, uh, I, I'd like to say Speaker Pelosi, Leader Pelosi, um, uh, called me and, and asked me to do it. And they asked me to do it, I think, for two reasons. One is that um, from a political standpoint, um, a, a large group of people in this country working class people, people that work on the assembly lines and in the factories, um, that have always been the backbone of the Democratic Party, uh, have been leaving that party lately and voting uh, in other directions. And I think everybody felt it's because 
we weren't communicating to those folks in a, in a way that they felt like we cared about them. And so when you heard that West Kentucky twang, I look like them, I sound like them, because I am one of them. Um, you know, I, I think that was part of it, that, that they wanted the Democratic Party to start talking to middle America again. And I think the second thing was, they knew this health care fight was coming and there's not a place in the country that's been more successful in implementing the Affordable Care Act than the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And so they wanted the spokesman that did it looking America in the eye and looking the president in the eye and saying, this works. Yes, it needs some fixes, but this works. Mm -hmm. And you know, apparently that worked because it wasn't a week later that the White House had sent the Vice President, uh, Mike Pence, to Kentucky to give a speech and say what a disaster uh, it was in Kentucky, which of course is not true and the, and, and the facts speak otherwise. And then a week after that, the President himself came and, and came to Kentucky and said the same thing. I didn't know I was so powerful <laughs> to move the two top elected officials in the country like that. but. Uh, I do think it centered the the focus on health care. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, you talk about sitting in a diner uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, my hometown, uh, where Jane and I live now, and, and giving that. Number one, um, it, it was a tremendous honor for me, but, but you know, when you're thinking, you've got a screen over here and you're just seeing the president wind up, standing up there in, in the halls of Congress with all the pomp and circumstances, and here I am sitting here in a chair without a coat and tie, and we're in a diner. You know, it's a, it's a and, little bit of a different look. who were those people behind you? They were mannequins. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's what some people said, you know, because in ABC News, ABC was the was the uh, pool network, and they were the ones uh, that said, "Now look, nothing on the tables. Don't anybody move because you'll distract from the governor giving his talk and everything." So, you know, they were all sitting there like this, and I heard some about that. But but let me say this, you know, I, I saw some uh, comment that said. Well, why are we even trying to talk to those people out there? At most, we might be able to get four or five percent of them. Well, let me tell you something. You give me four or five percent more, and I'll win nine out of ten races in this country. Mm -hmm. I'll win almost every swing district in Kentucky for Congress and for the United States Senate. I'll win almost every governor's race. I'll win legislative races because that's about what usually happens in a race. I mean, it's usually not more than four or five percent difference. So that's why. And, and I feel very passionate about this as a Democrat. I, we've got to get back to talking to people all across the country, not just to this group or that group, but the, on the issues that matter the most. And you know what that is? That's jobs. That's, that's getting our people back to work. And it's so that a, a person can feel financially secure, that, that I can provide for my family, I can keep a roof over our head and, and clothes on uh, our backs and food on the table and send my kids to school so that they'll have a better life than what I'm having. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the American dream. And we've got to get back to talking about providing that kind of opportunity, removing the obstacles out of people's way so that they've got a chance to succeed and realize that American dream. Mm -hmm. So we're almost out of time. Um, one final thing. So you've been here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and around here with our students and other folks. I don't know if you feel like a fish out of water up here or not, but um, what, what's, what's your um, observation about the time that you've been able to spend here and what have you observed about uh, being in academia in this uh, public health environment and, uh, and what's, what's a key takeaway you would like people to remember and recall from your time here? Well, first of all, this is it's a great experience, and I'm I'm still going through it. And and the biggest the biggest plus for me is being in that classroom with those students. Uh, number one, I know they're smarter than I am. Uh, but number two, I hope I can I can convey to them some of the practical sides of life and getting things done. Because the leadership things that I talk about, obviously they're from a political angle because that's what my life's been. But they can take those different traits no matter what they do, no matter what line of work they're in. I mean, those traits can help you be successful, whether it's 
in your church or synagogue or mosque or in a nonprofit that you're working with or in your everyday work that you're doing. Um, and, the, and the thing that I want them to take away more than anything is you can do anything you are big enough to think you can do. In the end, do not dream small. Uh, reach out and go for that brass ring. If you don't happen to get it, you back up and you start again and you go after another brass ring. But, but life is out there for you to grab. And they start off with such a, a elevated position at, at this great school. I mean, you know, man, oh man, to come off of an education here at Harvard and to go out in that world, I mean, you got one leg up already. But you got to take it and make it for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a good foundation, but in the end, you've got to grab hold of the future and make it your own. But, but these people have the talent to do that. And they're the leaders of tomorrow. And if they want to make change happen, they can make change happen. You can make it in a big way if you happen to be up on some political level maybe. But you can make it, you know, in, in the rehabilitation center where one out of those 10 people gets back up on their feet and becomes a productive member of society. And if you've helped that happen, you, you've changed this world. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Governor, thank you for your public service and for the many contributions you've made. Um, if you like this, there's a book coming out called People <laughs> Over Politics on Amazon very shortly. Get your advanced copy and maybe you could bring it by and people could get your signature on it to. as well. Governor, thank you for being with us today. Thank it's you, an John. honor. Thank you. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.